And so I realized that actually fandom was teaching me something about economics, about women's economic resources and resolve. And what does it mean when you have a job and how that changes your self-esteem? Because a lot of these women, for them, watching Mr. Khan was a way for them to flex their economic power. They suddenly had economic power. They were making money and they could use it whichever way they wanted. And that was a source of tremendous pride. <laughs> Welcome to the fourth episode of the Anayata Speaker Series. This Carnegie India initiative aims to inspire young professionals by curating stirring stories of empowerment, struggle, and success from women professionals in different fields from across the globe. My name is Sanya Buthiraja, and as the Communications and Programs Coordinator at Carnegie India, I've been given the opportunity to host today's episode. With that, please allow me to introduce you to our guest speaker today the very inspirational, very intelligent, and very eloquent Shriana Bhattacharya. Shriana is an economist in the World Bank's Social Protection and Labor Unit for South Asia. Before joining the World Bank, she had worked at ISSD, ILO, SEWA, and Center for Policy Research on a range of issues in the areas of urban bureaucracy, social protection, and informality. She completed her post-graduation in public administration and economics from Harvard, and she's the author of the must-read recently published book, Desperately Seeking, Shah Rukh Khan, India's Lonely Young Women and, and the Search for Intimacy and Independence. Hi, hi, Shayana. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'll just, so... I'll just start off with the questions. Um, you obviously have a super impressive CV. So I just want to start by asking you what inspired you to do all of this? What inspired you to become a feminist economist, as you say? Thanks so much, Sanya. Uh, I think, honestly, what inspires me and moves my work is a sense of service. I feel like all of us are extremely privileged, especially in an extremely unequal country. I think growing up, uh, my mother was a social worker and I think somehow watching her deal with extremely precarious communities, people dealing with a lot of trouble and difficulties in their lives. I think as a very young kid, I was extremely aware of how lucky uh, someone like me was. And I think then with that luck comes duty and obligation. Uh, you have to make something of it. And I always, as lofty and as sort of, you know, uh, uh, odd as it may sound but I really feel like everything that I've done it, the idea has always been to at least be a use to someone or the other it could be even in my immediate sphere it's not a question of helping lots and lots of people or doing like activism but just you know paying your domestic worker a good wage or you know simple things like that and then moving from there of course given that I have a technical background in economics I had and I was lucky to actually you know actuate and pursue I essentially was able to then work in a space where you could impact through policy or through programs larger groups of people and I've been very committed to that to pr at least provide rigorous insight um, into the work that I do and being a woman I think um, in India that has so many connotations both psychological social economic and you grow up very aware of that, just the way you hold your body in public space, the way you navigate relationships, families, all of these things, right? Gender is so salient. It's such an important axis of inequality, irrespective of your caste or your class group. And I think growing up with that, I was acutely conscious that I really did want to sort of be useful and uh, create some sense of solidarity with other women. And I think the book my work at the World Bank, all of that is in a way, I think, motivated by the sense of service uh, to try and be useful, if not to large communities, but at least to like one person, even if it's in my immediate sphere. 
um so yeah i i think that's largely what's you know sense of service has really what has been what's motivated me that's very fascinating and uh i i'm like i'm i'm, I'm sure i can definitely relate to what you're saying and just to sort of uh draw more more of those parallels sort of between your your work as an economist in the book itself how did your work inspire you um to to look at sort of gender economics in india through such a unique lens of pop culture and sharuk khan thanks sanya you know if somebody had ever said to me when i was in my 20s that i would write a book or i would have anything useful to say about um, the way the economy functions for women using my favorite actor and honestly my favorite person who i don't know uh, i don't know him but he is my favorite person uh, as a lens i would just look at them and roll my eyes and say you know what rubbish you know that's just that makes no sense and it's funny how now 15 years later i am at this stage and i think the first thing i do want to tell everyone is that it happened purely by accident um in 2006 i was in my early 20s i had just finished you know how in india you quickly finish an undergraduate degree then you quickly finish a masters and you're very young all of us start working very young i think certainly especially i think those of us who were educated or you know in the 90s particular i think nowadays it's still become a more popular for young take a bit of a break after college but back then when i was in college that really wasn't the case you just expected to study quickly and you know get to work and i was very young i was working for a feminist think tank called the institute of social studies trust i was sent to the slum in amdabad to collect data on women who were making incense sticks at home agarbattis and they were earning about a quarter of minimum wage and when i went to these areas very excited to you know do my first survey i was so you know enthusiastic about you know data quantitative data you know gaining insights you know there's an exhilaration when you're young and you're sent out to work uh, i i met a bunch of women who just looked thoroughly bored when i asked them my questions because to them they were all unionizing actually uh, these were all women who were extremely well aware of their economic challenges deprivations rights entitlements and they were extremely strong leaders in their own community and to them they just looked at me as some kind of cliche you know a girl wearing kajal in a khadi kurta who they have seen multiple times before uh and so they just well they they humored me and answered my questions but they were so bored when we were doing the surveys and when we would ask them typical questions about wages working conditions hours of work so to ease things up because i really was conscious that i didn't want people to be bored of my you know what i was asking them uh to ease things up i essentially started talking to them about some things that we had in common and i would ask everyone as an icebreaker you know who's your favorite actor and they all mentioned sharukh everywhere i went there were huge fans of mr khan and suddenly i noticed that the tone texture energy of the conversations just completely opened up suddenly all these women who were very bored and they thought all these standard survey questions about wages and work were very you know tedious suddenly they were very excited to tell me all the things that they thought about mr khan about the about his songs about his scenes what they had seen and i decided that there was something very important in what they were saying simply because of that shift in energy between myself and these women that i didn't really know and they came from such different backgrounds than me that i then decided let me probe further and i did and i probed for nearly 10 years i followed uh, because from the slums of amdabad when i went to rural up forests of jharkhand different places even in my own just immediate life i would meet sharuk female fans everywhere and i made it a point to just ask them as i love talking about him so i made it a point to ask them you know why do you like him what did you watch why did you watch him and it really surprised me as i started to listen to the notes because i collected notes for almost a decade that i realized that each time these women were talking about mr khan actually they were talking about their economic struggles because they were telling me about how it was so difficult for them to make money to find free time to access media or a mobile phone or any kind or a cinema hall to access film so something that you know someone like me takes for granted the ability to just watch a film is so difficult for so many women in our country and i was really moved by those stories 
and so i realized that actually fandom was teaching me something about economics about women's economic resources and resolve and what does it mean when you have a job and how that changes your self esteem because a lot of these women for them watching mr khan was a way for them to flex their economic power they suddenly had economic power they were making money and they could use it whichever way they wanted and that was a source of tremendous pride for them and i thought the stories were really moving and the other thing i realized when they were talking about him was they were talking about a way men can be more supportive of women as they try and pursue their professional ambitions and this is true across classes i mean in the book there are women from different class groups um you know there are women trying to run independent garment businesses in rural up and in their immediate lives their men are not very supportive of the fact that they want to have an independent livelihood of their own and they enjoy their jobs and in fact in the stories in the book you see many men say well if i'm earning enough why do you need to work you might as well just leave but the resolve that these women have to continue it's also exhausting because you're constantly fighting with loved ones you're constantly in a way you know there's a kind of set of interactions that are not particularly pleasant right especially with people who you care about your husbands lovers daughters brothers mothers and so on and so i think there they were talking about mr khan as a way of someone who just gave them relief entertainment escape when real life and all its economic struggles and its personal struggles just became so exhausting because actually fighting you know in in feminism we're all fighting for perhaps a better idea of a world but it's also very exhausting any kind of fight and it doesn't need to be on twitter or out on the streets as protest but any kind of action where you are pushing against a social norm and in the book the one norm that all these women are pushing against is women should ideally women are good women in our society if they are at home and they are caring and they are mothering full time uh all these women defy that norm and they want to hold on to jobs and they really enjoy having a professional identity of their own and when they defy that norm it's also exhausting and i think he is in a way escape entertainment and comfort so i surprised myself by realizing after 10 odd years of this kind of research that actually talking to women about mr khan provided a very unusual lens to actually enter into their economic struggles and personal struggles and also to show that actually economics and intimacy are very closely related because of what i just explained that exhaustion um and that's the story of the book but i did it did come as an accident it's it's not it's not something that i think i had a design to do it just i just decided i think i on instinct i decided i wanted to keep having these conversations purely for the joy of it because i just love talking about him with anyone uh and i love talking about economics and so it just worked out and i think so it's it, i think it's a story of when you follow your passion and you follow your interests and things that actually interest you and give you delight um you will then stumble upon surprising frameworks um and i think this is true for almost anything that makes sense and and you know it seems like um you sort of met this professional challenge of sort of um connecting with the people you were researching about on like a on like a deeper level and mm. Shahrukh Khan sort of acted as a more to build that that sort of um connection and have more of a bond with them so they can open up more so i just want to inquire what are some of the other challenges that you faced in your professional life and how did you go about overcoming them well i think uh, as a woman uh, the first challenge that unfortunately we live in a society where women have to jump through hoops to gain legitimacy for their technical insights and their voice we still live in a country especially i think in areas that i tend to work in you know be it government be it policy be it sort of old generational think tanks i think women are entering these spaces and and they they're increasingly much more prominent in these spaces but my sense is that even with that you have to fight and and i think my story and my challenges are of uh, you know trying to gain legitimacy and fighting to gain legitimacy and by that i'll give you an example i remember when i joined the world bank um, i think into the first year i was working with a government client uh, who is a senior official in uh, state government and he wouldn't look at me when i would talk 
uh, he would look at my male colleagues or you know and even when i was presenting and and i realized from some other female uh, colleagues in his office that this was very common he came from a very conservative background i actually don't think this was a i don't think he was doing it in a way to necessarily ignore but i think this is the way he was brought up this is his socialization right um and i had two choices at that point i could either just i had the option because colleagues in my office are extremely supportive and they noticed what was happening and they said well would you like to just work on another project and maybe we work with another client for you i mean i could be moved out of that team or do you want to sort of push through with this and i decided and this i think connects to the theme in the book as well you know your own personal resolve right i wanted to work on this project it was extremely exciting and i said well i will stick with it and surprisingly uh, through sheer you know hard work because we were providing insights to this particular official that were very useful in a program he was designing eventually he and i ended up having a very cordial and uh, relationship like he and i will exchange whatsapp messages now you know it it changed and i think so I, i i realize this is not true for every encounter there can be encounters when i've had encounters where people will not take you seriously people will not listen to you and then at some level you just have to also just cut your losses and and try and move on but there are also instances where i've noticed that people will shift their beliefs and they will change as well and i think we are a society particularly when it comes to women's roles in public arenas of leadership be it politics be it entrepreneurship be it policy um we do have a new generation of women who are much more confident much more sort of keen to assert their presence and men are struggling as well i think and old structures are struggling to deal with this and accommodate that and so i accept that i think some of the frustrations that i felt or the challenges i faced are very natural outcomes of a very large social change it's not about me you know sometimes you end up feeling like oh it's about you personally but it's not it's i think it's a larger structural story of a society that's changing for women and it's not surprising then that i have to meet these challenges uh, but to me i've always been very committed to i want to work on what i want to work on um and if someone else in that environment is 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 reluctant not willing either you try and engage with them in an open honest dialogue and try and again go back you know that original thing that i said be useful be of service um and if even after that things don't change you have to cut your losses and move forward and recognize that it's not about you personally because i find often with women we tend to take it up make it about ourselves then there's like questions of self worth and self confidence that come in um one thing i learned very early on because i had fabulous female mentors as well at my office i learned very early on that this is not about me it's about a larger social change and i was just part of it that's all thank you so much for sharing that that like anecdote with us and and also your experiences because i'm sure a lot of our viewers will sort of relate to those and it it almost brings me back to your what you just said in your previous question that you know women have to sort of have that women have that extra struggle of not just working and working on a project but sort of dealing with all of these external factors that impact their performance um but now moving on from sort of your career and the amazing advice that you've given to people who may be in a similar situation um moving on to the book which i obviously read and i completely loved it um there was a line that particularly caught my attention and i wanted to discuss that with you um i have i have it here with me so i'll just read it um it it goes something like while the covid-19 crisis pushed many indian men from good jobs towards precarious self employment women simply exited the workforce so now i know my next question may be a little bit hard to answer because we are still going through a pandemic but in your opinion how has this sort of reduction in the purchasing power of one gender how is it going to impact um the future of india's economy and india's workforce thanks so i think we should first take a step back to recognize that covid-19 the pandemic in general has just exacerbated all kinds of pre-existing fault lines in our economy so communities that generally tended to not do well in our economy be it uh tribal communities be it women uh, be it informal workers uh this has just devastated those far more and these are now extremely 
grim statistics that we're looking at when it comes to particularly these groups who are already at a disadvantage in the labor market. And I think the pandemic has only exacerbated this. Now, given that, um, you see this big drop for women. So five out of 10 working women have not returned to the workforce. And even the latest CMIE data, which just came out, is very disappointing when you look at the trends for women in the workforce. I think this has two long run ramifications, which are to me very disturbing. And I mentioned this in the book. One is, you know, the economy and employment is not just about instrumental growth statistics. I mean, you know, there's a way people will say, well, if women work, the economy will grow more. Of course, because you need more workers, more productivity, more income. There's that very linear economic channel. We all know it. Macroeconomists talk about it all the time. So many agencies across the world have been very worried about India's female employment crisis precisely because there's a huge growth dividend that is not being capitalized on because half the population is just, its creative potential, potentials are just not being used. Uh, they're being used for caring, but they're not being paid or rewarded either for caring. So there's an instrumental story there about just growth, right, and productivity. Um, but to me, actually, the more worrying aspect of this is the more psychological aspect of employment. Because, you know, when we think of employment, it's not just um, a job as a statistic or as an income. A job can give you a sense of meaning. It can give you, I mean, this is true for you. This is true for me. We like our jobs. We may not always love our jobs, but it gives us a sense of purpose. We like who we are. We like our colleagues. It gives us exposure to the world outside, right? Beyond our traditional communities. It means that we will mingle with people beyond our immediate caste or community networks. There is a huge psychological dividend and a, almost a social solidarity dividend of a job's agenda, right? Like it's not just about money, it's about meaning. And to me, what's really worrying, and I think this is something I was trying to convey in the book, is that given the amount of meaning these women, at least in my book, derive from having an independent income. And it doesn't need to be some big fancy job. It's just someone who's making even something at home. The fact that she earns something extra means something to her. She enjoys doing her garment work. She enjoys cooking for her family as well. She may enjoy her care work as well, but she enjoys these other jobs. And by constantly having an economy that deprives women of those opportunities, because we're not supporting their care burdens enough, we're not subsidizing the pathways for women to access jobs better, you are robbing an entire half of your population of just self-worth and self-confidence. And so to me, that's the really worrying long-term implication of this. Uh, which is a huge psychological dividend. And you see it, you know, India has one of the highest depression rates for women. There are all kinds of mental health aspects of this as well. And we will also end up becoming a very close society because when women are out, they mingle with men as well beyond their communities. And there are, you know, important, um, there's a lot of mixing and churn in a society as different, you know, with so much difference as ours. That's a good thing. That's a part of our modernity project. And we're completely failing on that project. We're going in the opposite direction where we're becoming even more segregated, right? And I think if women were working and were out and about, uh, there would be huge social shifts you would see in our community structures and our caste structures. Um, just, you know, the sheer fact that women are out and they're confident and they're sort of acting on their ambitions, right? So, so to me, that's one long-term very worrying consequence, which is why I really hope um, we're speaking while the budget is on. I really hope that we see um, interventions that ease credibly uh, women's abilities and constraints to actually actuate their professional ambition. So that's one. I think the second aspect of this that really worries me is that in almost corollary to this, we are burdening men with essentially the economic burden of, you know, a very catastrophic economy right now. Uh, you know, feminism and an economy that works for, you know, women will actually work for men as well. I mean, this is not just, this is not a, I, I, I don't see this as an either or situation. So for example, what's happening now is you have single earner households or men who are earning there's a lot of tension in earning money in the world outside. It is not easy. And ideally, you know, dual income households earn more. They can support each other more. And yet right now we are investing and almost solidifying this kind of masculinity, which is very, you know, 
it's almost it puts on this pretense of being very strong because they have to earn money and they have to sort of be out in the world but maybe men want to do different things maybe there are men who actually like you know cooking and maybe there are men who want to be carers i certainly know some of them but we're not allowing for those creative potentials in men as well to be explored and so what's happening is we have this very rigid division of labor where women are supposed to do the work inside and yet it's unacknowledged not rewarded men are supposed to do the work outside and maybe they don't always want to be doing the work outside we don't know that and i think the long term implication of this is of course it's it's it, you will see it in depressed employment statistics depressed growth difficult coping mechanisms because if households don't have additional incomes the ability to cope to a, with a crisis is obviously compromised so there are the linear economic channels but there are also very complex social channels about masculinity about the self worth and psychological well being of women um and the fact that i think jobs for women produce more progressive societies there's data that shows that when there are more women out and about working their sons grow up to be more progressive more liberal views um because they see that women in their own immediate lives don't breed for their service i mentioned this in the book and so to me the jobs agenda for women is not just about well we need incomes for women i think there's a whole social story there about what kind of social change that can bring about for the better and for more solidarity between men and women and also between communities um and where women feel more confident in themselves and to me that's the really worrying legacy of the pandemic uh, of what we're seeing with the data and i really hope that there are solutions that try and address that um and thank you i i i i found your answer like very fascinating and holistic so thanks for that and just moving a bit more along the talk of the book um so i found it super relatable and informative and i as soon as i read it i recommended it to all my friends and my mom and my aunts and you know they were quite keen to read it because of the title and the content of the book and this got me thinking like i think a lot of women are anyway going to read this book because they it's it's like sort of about them it like mirrors their life in their society but are men really ready to face the facts that are in the book so my question to you is who do you think is the ideal audience for this piece of work and what would you want for them to take away after they have like read it thanks uh, everyone who can read english is the ideal audience for the book i wrote it honestly um i think i I've, i've been saying this a lot uh, everywhere i've been talking about the book it's not about mr khan or his films they come up but they come up as a research technique uh, it's about women and men and how the economy is shaping gender relations in our society and how men feel about themselves how women feel about themselves certainly and i really want the reader to walk away from realizing that your everyday you know negative feelings jealousy anxiety lack of confidence or even joy so much of that has to do with the very economic frameworks of our country are working uh, how they are set up what are they incentivizing there are taxes incentives that are being played out in our day to day interpersonal lives and i think the book gives you a very granular flavor of that for people who don't have a background in economics um so i i think the ideal reader for this book is everyone um and having said that i have noticed when the book came out uh someone initially thought that it was fan fiction for Mr Khan and I have re- written fan fiction for Mr Khan but that is not out in the public domain and it will never be uh I I mean I wouldn't do that to myself or to him or to anyone and yeah and so I I did note that I think that's shifted I think as the book was sort of read and it it was circulated and so on that that idea that it's about Mr Khan has changed I think people realize increasingly it's a more it's a it's a social look at the economy that the economy contains all our social personal relationships and it's actually a story about that and Mr Khan is his popularity is an entry point to discuss those issues and so I really want the reader to walk away with just a recognition that the way you feel about yourself uh economic frameworks have a lot to do with why that's happening and maybe then some young people will get more interested in economics which would be great um and perhaps more people will watch a few more of Mr Khan's films those who don't already know his movies i think just also to understand why is it that he is so powerful in this conversation i think that's a really fascinating story as well i will say though that uh i do know that the book is uh, perplexed some straight men uh 
I noticed that in fact the initial reactions that have been just so heartwarming and I've really had moments where I've like cried when I read some of these messages have been from uh women and lots of gay men um which is really interesting to me but uh, there are straight men who love the book but i also notice that there are many straight men who sort of think the moment you men- mention char or or the loneliness of women it does make them a bit uncomfortable uh, so i've been encouraging everyone gifted to a man especially sort of an alpha man uh, gifted to them uh, perhaps you can encourage them to read it thank you for that answer um i'll be sure to give this book to my dad and and anybody else who you know i i i think is in is in need to read this right now um and actually your answer brings us uh, really well into into my last question basically because you spoke a lot about how greater structures in the economy and policies have such a personal impact on people's lives and mental health and well-being so um in preparation for this talk i basically watched a bunch of interviews that you did and i noticed that you spoke a lot about um striking a balance between empathy and economics and i was wondering what advice uh if any you had for young economists who may be going out into the field in terms of like how they can strike this perfect balance the first piece of advice that i would have to anyone who is a young economist uh, going into the field um is to actually firstly realize the field is everywhere the field is not you know just when they send you to the villages of jharkhand or not just when they send you to the slums of ahmedabad the field is your home uh, notice the interactions and the way economic incentives and taxes shape the way people behave the field is the coffee shop you go to for your i don't know we can catch up with friends the field is your cinema hall the field is netflix you're watching the field is everywhere one of my favorite poems is um i forget the name of the poet but he has this beautiful line where he says um uh, this is always the case uh, when i am in the field i think it's something about how the field is everywhere essentially uh, and uh, and i i really want i think all young economists to acknowledge that anything is worthy of study because i think the the language of economics is so powerful it can help you i think think through frameworks about just our everyday lives and i really encourage i think young people who are interested in these kinds of questions to think a lot more carefully about how economic frameworks are just impacting people around them um, and of course you want to go to the villages of jharkhand and bihar and do work that that's great as well of course but recognize that the field is all around us i mean it's not just you going to a specific place to do research we are in the field always that's one um i think the second thing i would say to economists or young economists is i think the path to actually doing really good research is just to listen it sounds really banal and traditional but i i really think we say a lot about listening but we don't do enough listening and one of the things i realized simply because i mean i'm as self obsessed as i think anyone of us in our culture currently is sort of encouraged to be but i think because of mr khan and because i just love him so much i just love his films so much that i am very happy to shut up and listen to somebody else talk about him and i think the fact that i took this time to just listen uh, and not to dismiss things that people said as being silly or foolish or uninteresting if you genuinely listen not just about your very narrow research topic but just listen to people talk about anything that interests them uh you learn a lot more and i think your work will be infused with a kind of energy um that would be really i think is very electric and uh, i i think listening and actually listening beyond the narrow confines of you know just what your project is about is i think really helpful and i've been saying this everywhere and i think the book is testimony to this which is i really believe all of us are philosophers each one of us it doesn't matter what you've been educated how educated you are it really doesn't matter how posh you are or whether you've read like french philosophers each one of us has a theory on life and if you hear from if you are privileged enough that people share their theory of life with you i think that's the space for really interesting economics be it the work of all the economists that i really admire and i think people who won nobel laureates i think so so much of that work is essentially economists just paying attention to people and just listening to people and not listening just for their rigid research purposes but just listening at large 
uh, so if you've been privileged enough to be sent to places that i think you know a lot of other people would not be paid to go ask people questions you should listen um and so i think i just have two pieces of advice one the field is everywhere and second just listen and credibly listen thank you so much for all that advice um i i really wish i could talk to you for longer but unfortunately we've run out of all the time we had together um i just want to thank you once again for taking the time to talk to us today about your life and about your journey and about your very very interesting book um i found this discussion incredibly fascinating and i'm sure our audiences uh would do thank you so much sanya you were so kind and your questions were so fantastic this was really like a fun conversation for me to have um and hopefully we will all meet sometime in the future when things are a lot more stable and i wish all of you good health and thank you so much for inviting me this has been such a pleasure thank you to our audiences we sincerely hope that you enjoyed today's episode if so please subscribe to our youtube channel and press the bell icon to get regular updates